In today's talk, we're going to learn how to critique a regression model. Now, regression is just the technical term used for predicting a number. Now, it's just a little bit of a grammar and bullying issue that you're not allowed to say, I have a problem where I'm trying to predict a number. You can say very much more specifically, I have a problem where I'm trying to predict a dollar value. And you can say, I have a regression problem, but you just consider a little off if you say, I have a problem where I'm trying to predict a numeric value. Um, not really a lot of value added in that distinction. Just be aware of that. It's just sort of a little grammar or etiquette warning. Not one I endorse, but one I'm very aware of. I don't like winding up brilliant students or, and having them go out and get criticized for stuff they're not getting wrong. Um, so in my field, I'm almost always um, consulting on um, problems involving regression of sales values, be they ad clicks or conversions to sale when being called. And in that situation, we have basically, um, we have our actual values, y. And they're subscripted with an i. i is the ith actual value. And then we also have our prediction, which is, um, Let's call it VI, the value we're predicting. And VI is usually a deterministic function of a vector. So XI is actually a vector. Uh, Y and VI are just scalars or numbers. XI is a vector called the explanatory variables, or what we know when we're asked to predict VI. It's usually a deterministic function. But what we want is these to be close. We want our predictions to be close to the values they're supposed to be. Now, how do we systematically ensure that? Well, roughly what we say is we want yi minus vi small. Now, we don't really mean small. We mean near zero. Because you, know, you could consider um, negative 1,000 to be a small number, but that means this prediction is way far off. So we want this quantity to be zero for each and every row, and we'll probably sum across all rows to check it across all rows. Now, this is again running into problems that we, um, it's not enough to say this sum is near zero because it could be we're way over on the first estimate and way under on the second estimate. So this sum of estimates being near zero is not a strong enough condition. So we need to say that you can't make a big error on one row and the opposite error on the next example and cancel them out. So we need something that forces each row to be simultaneously near zero. Now, the obvious, in my mind, way to do that would be to take the absolute value. So absolute value, again, is just a function that removes the sign from a number. So absolute value of 3 is 3, absolute value of 0 is 0, and absolute value of negative 3 is, again, just positive 3. So now the errors cannot cancel. So this sum near 0 is tempting. However, I'm going to argue for technical reasons this is not what we want to optimize. What we would like to optimize is actually this quantity. We want this near zero. Or equivalently, since this is always non-negative, minimized. So I would say this is not at first blush, a natural definition. If, if our example is, again, predicting the value of something in dollars, well, then yi is in dollars, vi is in dollars, this difference is in dollars, and then the square of it's in dollars squared. So the, this whole sum is in this weird unit, dollars squared, just unnatural unit. Um, that's a valid criticism. We will work around it. It's not a problem with this absolute value formulation, but there's some reasons we won't use this absolute value formulation, which we'll go into by example right here. So. For terms, this is called the error or residual. Then this is the square error. And then this is the sum of square errors. That's not too bad. Now, what we're going to say is most common regression metrics or criticisms of numeric predictions are basic simple functions of the SSE. 
the SSE is fundamental, and it basically, you minimize this, you minimize all the other functions, because they're, they're simple transforms of it. So this is really telling the whole story, just maybe not in a precisely great way, and we want to renormalize, make things easier in our human brains. And we'll talk about what renormalization is in a little bit. But first, let's talk about the difference between this and this. So the example I'm going to use, and I think it's very close to how all my business clients work, or very many of them, is we have a task like pursuing sales leads. And each time we pursue a lead, it costs us $1. And sales leads, like so much in this life, are essentially lottery tickets. So each of these tickets matches the coupon. So you, you can tell that this is the winner, and it matches this coupon. So this is the one sales lead of this set that'll convert, and these others don't. And let's say the sales lead that converts is worth $10. So let me write that down. Cost, $1 ticket. Win, $10 on one ticket. So there's one and only one winning ticket, and there, there's five tickets in total. I'll just add that in. Five tickets total. This is just a motivating example. So there's five tickets total. One and only one of them is the winner. The winner is worth $10. Each ticket costs $5. It's simulating interacting with potential sales leads. Obviously, most of these leads don't succeed. Four out of five of them fail. However, this one's worth money. So much money that it is worth interacting with all five to get this one. So we, if we called all five of these lottery tickets with no knowledge of which one's the winner, so we call all five of them, then the winners in the set we interacted with, so we get the $10, and we spent five interacting with all the tickets. So for a $5 investment, we get $10 back, so that makes sense. And this is even with a model that is not good enough to say which is the winning ticket. Now, it could be a model that's assigning zero cost to many other, sorry, zero value to many other tickets. That it directed us down to these five. These are your best sales prospects in expected value. Maybe this one's worth a penny on estimate, this one's worth negative $100, they're going to sue you on estimate. So the model directed us down to a family of values that are the expected value of the group is high. We buy up that whole group and hopefully make money. And that's basically how we run our business. And again, notice we're not preternaturally accurate. We're actually, if you were to say this, the model predicts these tickets will convert, it's wrong four times out of five. It just says, no, no, these tickets have a high enough conversion probability or rate or expected value that um, worth doing. We'll get into probability criticism in another lecture, but this is basically expected value. If the model says each and every one of these tickets is worth enough to invest, we'll do it. So let's see what these two models say for this situation. Well, so we're assuming that the for these five tickets, the explanatory variables are identical. We cannot tell the difference between them. They're just identical prospects from what we've measured. So that means if this is a deterministic function, which it almost always is, it would be the same prediction for each and every one of those tickets. So what prediction would this make for that set, ideally? Well, so if y is the values, um, so y is the values 0, 0, 10, 0, 0, and the model can't tell them apart, but it saw these values during training or something very similar during training. It has to make a, we're going to force it to make a prediction where the V is identical for each of them. Um, well, what prediction minimizes this loss criticism? Because that's how we get to our implementation. We don't have to implement regression. We just give it a loss, and then it realizes the uh, effect. So what loss, well, sorry, what solution to this would minimize absolute value loss. And that's the funny thing. Absolute value is minimized at the median. The median is any number where at least half the values are above it, or no, sorry, at least half the values are above it or at it, and at least half the values are below it or at it. So the median of these five numbers is zero because all five of them are at least that large and four of them are no smaller. So this is the median. So the prediction would be V is these five numbers, that every single ticket is worth zero dollars for the median system. 
Well, that's interesting because that's incredibly biased. If we bought all five tickets, the model says they're worth nothing as a group, whereas a group, the, the actuality, they're worth 10. So even though this model is perfectly right on four out of five of the things, it makes a big enough error here to undo that. It thinks the whole group is worth zero, when in reality the whole group is worth 10. So it's downward biased. Let's do the same prediction for this. Well, it turns out it's a little easier to derive than this fact, which I'll have to leave underived. The minimizer for square error is mean. So these tickets are worth um, $2 on average. So the model would predict $2 each if it had access to them as training data or something very similar to them as training data. Well, so that's um, different. So it's wrong on each and every ticket. It's off by $2 squared here, or 4. It's off by $8 squared here, or 64. So it's, it's off on every single ticket according to its own loss. But this is where the loss is minimized at the mean. However, here's the point. The mean gets the total right. It says this group of tickets is worth $10. It doesn't know which ticket is the valuable one, but it knows as an aggregate, 5 times 2 equals 1 times 10. It gets the aggregate right. Using the model, we could do the same thing that knowing the outcome would tell us. Buy all five, interact with all five of those leads and make some money. So even though the, if someone knew exactly what the right ticket was, they'd do even better because they would interact with just that one, not interact with the other four. But this model still gives really valuable advice, even though in some sense it's mostly wrong. Um, so this is why this sort of modeling is so valuable to us. Now, why? Is this minimized at the mean? Well, you know, it, it's basically, it comes from calculus that if we take the derivative of, we're using the same prediction everywhere. If we take the derivative of that with respect to the prediction, because the, um, this thing will be minimized either at one of the extreme points or at some place where the derivative is zero, and there are no extreme points. We can predict up to plus or minus infinity. So the minimum has to be where this um, derivative is zero. Well, the derivative of a square, derivative goes right through sum. The derivative of a square is just two times the quantity. And we're looking for that to equal zero. Well, that gives away the whole thing. I can just move things around, and I get 2 times sum i y i equals 2 times sum i v. Um, cross out the 2s, and sum i v is just n v if n is our number of uh, rows. So we get 1 over n sum i y i equals v. Because this is nv, and then I pull the n over. So v is the average. It also is the number that matches the total when summed up. So that is the winning property for using this loss function. It comes from the derivative structure. And it says, basically, these values that you're most wrong on, that's where to fix your model the most. And that's why it gets the group right, is it concentrated on that rare ticket. Now. This is the right metric, in my mind, for criticizing um, regression models. I have work on another talk where we talk about how to um, criticize probability or classification models. It's slightly different, but there's a lot of similar motivation. And from a machine point of view, this SSE is perfectly fine, because machines don't need to understand. For us, I say it's a little bit of a poison. It's got two complaints about it. Is one, it's in an unnatural unit, say dollars squared. And two, it depends on the data set size. That a data set that's 10 times larger, this would be 10 times larger. So it, it doesn't, it, you can't just look at the number, the SSE, and say, what does that mean as you're changing data sets? So there's some variations or normalizations, as I promised, of it. So one is the um, uh, mean square error. And MSE is just 1 over n sum i equals 1 to n y i minus v i squared. And you can see it, it's just basically the mean of the square error. Mean square error. And then there's, um, this is still in the wrong units. It's in dollars squared, but at least now it's independent of data set size. And so we usually normalize that a little further by going to the root mean square error, which is equal just to the square root of the MSE. 
So this was in dollars squared. We just knock it back into dollars by taking the square root. And this is a very common quantity. It's, it serves a very similar role to standard deviation. It says, typically, how off is your prediction? So if you're pricing houses that are in the $300,000 range and your RMSE is $10,000, that sounds like a pretty good model to me. If you're predicting houses that are in a $300,000 price range and your RMSE is $100,000, that sounds like a pretty bad model to me. So it, 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 you can build a physical sense of this if you have a physical sense of what you're predicting, because this is in a natural unit, independent of data set size, and it's in the same unit as what you were thinking about, dollars. And again, it's just basically a simple function of SSE. Because MSE, yeah, so this is equal to just 1 over n SSE. So, um, it all follows from SSE. There are other metrics, but this one's pretty fundamental. Now, there's one more, more way to renormalize SSE, and that leads us to another metric called the R squared, which I want to delay talking about the R squared till its own talk, because it has several technical points. But really, all it is is a renormalization and shift of the SSE. So any decision you made based on SSE, you'd make the same decision using R squared. It's basically any, just like the difference between Fahrenheit and Celsius. Any decision you make in Fahrenheit, you'd make the same one in Celsius. Yes, you'd write down the decision threshold differently, but they're measuring the same thing. And R squared related to SSE, it's very much the same. They differ by a shift and a scaling, just like Fahrenheit and Celsius differ by a shift and a scaling. Um, but again, R squared is a quantity that you might be able to talk about. SSE is hard to talk about, so RMSE is a normalization that I think makes it much easier to talk about. R squared is another normalization that makes it easy to talk about, but it doesn't change the mechanics of the system in any way. Anyway, thank you very much for your time. I hope this orients you into how to criticize a numeric or a regression model, and I'm definitely um, going to make a lot more of these little topic videos. Thank you.